On today's episode of the CLS Experience with a very exclusive tree, for nearly four decades, she has been at the forefront of demystifying intuition and seamlessly integrating it into the realms of business, science, medicine, and personal growth, just to name a few. She's not just any expert. She's a New York Times bestselling author and her unparalleled ability to predict significant global events such as the 2008 recession has garnered accolades from industry giants, including Brad Pitt, who once proclaimed, I believe in the gut and I believe in Laura Day. No big deal. Her mission extends beyond mere predictions. With an intense passion, she's dedicated herself to empowering individuals and organizations to harness their innate intuitive abilities, creating profound change, big facts. Through her workshops, presentations, and multiple best-selling books, she has guided thousands in tapping into their perceptions, intellect, and sixth sense to realize their dreams. She's just a juggernaut in all facets of life and a terrific human being. Please welcome the inspirational, beautiful, and brilliant, intuitive, trailblazing, the abundant Laura Day. How you doing, Laura? Oh my goodness. What a lovely intro. I'm blushing. This is awesome. You, you and I probably could have went on a, a two-hour rant before we hit record and we're like, hold up. Yes. and Save all this juicy stuff for the show. For our listeners, in case you're not familiar for our community, my best suggestion is to do a deep dive, play catch up, check out all her unbelievable work, everything she has going on. What I think is most valuable today is we just have an unbelievable conversation. But before we dive in, we're going to get a little weird. You ready for me? Oh, yeah. Please, I was doing weird before you were born. <laughs> do you already have an intuition of what I'm going to ask you? No, I, intuition doesn't work that way. Okay. I, I'm, I can't wait to find out more about that. My weird question is this. When you wake up every day for you personally, what are some non-negotiables for you? Wow, that's a really interesting question. I'm a creature of habit. Um, Same. A nice way of saying rigid. So everything is <laughs> non-negotiable. Um, I, I wake up hyper alert and kind of mentally check in on everybody. Uh, just in in my mind's eye and then I get out of bed before I have a complete nervous breakdown uh and then I take this Chinese tea that's non-negotiable my coffee's non-negotiable um my private time for uh, every once in a while a client wakes me up and I miss that private time and I'm kind of a beast all day so my private time uh a little bit of it is is pretty non-negotiable and um, my husband and I have a routine. There's a fly who's trying to like be part of this. Um, <laughs> my husband and I have a routine and it's not, non-negotiable is big because when you're, you know, when you're a mom, especially, but when you have clients, you negotiate everything for what they need. But the things that are really important to me is we, he has a sleep disorder he calls it I call it just insomnia and get off your screens which he won't do but <laughs> um, so we go out every morning and we have that 45 minutes together before we start our day he writes film and tv and and we have a I have a bat like basically a four per person bathtub and the, the beginning and the end of our evening together um, unless he's on set or unless I have an event those anchors at every at each end are pretty non-negotiables. But everything, I'm pretty rigid. Everything for me is pretty non-negotiable. I travel with a hotel room in a suitcase. I mean, everything. My pillow, my air filter, my Nespresso maker, my milk frother, every medication that known to man. Like I travel, I'm, I'm a turtle. I love this. I'll be honest with the audience right now. I get excited for all our guests. We're very selective and so forth, but I was specifically and intentionally excited for this one i just saw a lot of alignment and i'm really fascinated with the great stuff that you're doing you mentioned regimen and stuff like that i'm just curious when is your birthday march 22nd okay uh, 19, I, I'm eight, 19 what 1959 just get warmed up right that's how i feel my birthday is in april are you big into like astrology and like those signs and stuff you know I'm, I am and I'm not, I, I, um, a, whereas intuition gives you kind of exactness that you can say, no, this was right. This was wrong. 
astrology seems to give more of a generality. So there's no way for me to concretely prove it. But there are a lot of astrologers who I think are astrologers and also half intuitive. Um, so I, I, I believe in it an amount. You know, I don't sign documents during a Mercury retrograde if I can help it. Right. But um, but I don't uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure. I believe in certain people who are really amazing practitioners. What what date in April are you? 27th. Oh, so you're a Taurus. Correct. It's a little stubborn. <laughs> well, Aries aren't, you know, are not known for their flexibility. <laughs> That's a nice way of putting it. And I have a son who was born on my birthday who proves it even more. I thought I had heartburn, but. You have the same birthday as your son? I do. Wow. Why do I feel like that's not a coincidence? I I don't know, but it was quite something. I was very surprised. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, this is going to be so much fun. I want to make the most of every second. One of the many awesome things that you talk about is, is practical intuition. I think that's a good place to start. What exactly does that mean? Well, intuition, which is, you know, called off in the sixth sense, which is a misnomer or extrasensory perception or precognition or psychic skills, it's all been very mystified. And when you magicalize and mystify something, you don't make it useful uh, in your day-to-day -day life. And I think day-to-day -day life is a big, big bite, you know, that we have a lot to do each day, even if you're doing it imperfectly. So... I began really not from a philosophy, but back in the early 80s, there were a lot of experiments that were going on. People who wanted people with what they called unique brains like mine to test, does precognition exist? Does remote viewing exist? Can you actually perceive someone else's thoughts? So I was part, I was, I was a test subject. And so I came to intuition through, oh, wait, the brain does these things. And of course, there at the time for fundraising purposes, it was, we have these unique individuals. I realized, nah, that's kind of everybody. Um, but, uh, you know, in a way, perceiving a lot more just fragments you. So my 20s were, were spent a, with people saying, well, you know, we saw you can do this. Can you do this to tell us what's wrong with this uh, mechanical drawing? Or can you tell us uh, what's what's wrong with this medication? Or uh, I worked with a doctor on, I mean, worked, he did all the work. I did intuition for uh, new HIV. HIV was new on the scene. So new AIDS drugs, you know, can you tell if we give this drug at this dosage level, how many people are going to have side effects? So I really saw that I was trained by people saying, well, can you do this? And my saying, I don't know, but I, I'm happy to try and found that certain things I could and certain things I couldn't. But most of all found that this has a practical use, you know, things like finding your keys or your next job or believing yourself when you say, hmm, something's wrong here instead of getting further into trouble. And, and so my path, was to take this and as much as it's okay the whole past lives and dead people and esoteric and spiritual whatever i was having trouble as a 20 something year old making sense of every day so i was really not in i couldn't handle this life i did not want to go into other ones you know i couldn't handle the people who were here i didn't want to see other you know uh, spirit guides i mean i wanted really a concrete world to live in. And so that's really the clients I took. It's the way I used intuition in my own life. And for me, I have two siblings who've suicided. Intuition saved my life. And so for me, especially as I get older, and I think, what is the gift I want to leave on this planet? It, intuition is the thing that can take you in a turn using what you have and give you those practical leads that are right for you. They can, you can turn your life on a dime, not without effort, you know, that's magicalizing. So yeah. practical intuition is how do we use these weird way out skills in ways that just make our everyday life better. This is unbelievable.
So you said in your 20s, you were a test subject. What was the moment when you realized that you have this gift? I went into it thinking everybody's, I mean, when you're in your early 20s, you think everyone thinks like you do. So I didn't think, and I come from a pretty unstable, you know, very brilliant family. My father was a doctor. He just died a couple months ago. My mother was brilliant. My siblings were brilliant, but everyone was crazy. I came from a family where I had to remind my manic depressive mother that clothing might is not optional in New York City when you walk out the door. You know, and my father's a whole other story. Um, and and so I really just thought everyone saw the world like I did, and I just expressed it weirdly because certainly this ability evidenced itself early. You know, intuition, I'm sure everyone's had the experience of this. You say something you're that nobody told you, like, I'm sorry your grandmother died, and the grandmother dies two days later, like, or or you say, hi, James, without caller ID back in the day. And it is James. And it's like, how did you know? So, I mean, we all have these experiences. I assumed everybody was like I was. Um, and so really the aha was, oh, wow. Everyone doesn't know that that they're experiencing this. You know, everyone doesn't realize that. And and. Um, you know, one of the first things I did was take some of the tests. My first book, Practical Intuition, really is adapting things, the tests that were done on me and making them into exercises to hone people's intuitive skills. Yeah, this is this is so cool. And it, it's mine, for some reason, this analogy came to mind. Like if somebody was born on a deserted island and they assumed that green was really blue, they wouldn't know the difference because that's what they knew. And that's what you knew in your 20s. And I think that's what adulthood really is. It's realizing, A, everyone's the same, and B, we are all unique. And that that reality has to coexist. And how do we, how do we exercise our uniqueness in a way that's good for us? Because there's a flip side to everything, right? Everybody's unique is also weird. And um, and how do you exercise it in a way that that benefits you? I mean, my my son likes to remind you, Ma, you make a living doing something that nobody ever believed in. You know, I mean, you know, people like me had cats and wore purple and looked at crystal <laughs> walls. They didn't work with Fortune 500 companies. And I think it was because there was no belief system around it that when people said, well, can you do this? I said, well, I don't know, but I'm sure happy to try. Yeah, this is so cool. For those people that maybe don't have it like you do, what is the way, first of all, can you? And if so, what is a tangible way that people can cultivate intuition? So people are, my brain is damaged for lack of a better word. It's in a way that is great for intuition. But for example, I couldn't have become a doctor because I have, I I have no, my very little memory. So I can't, for example, remember a circulatory system and do it on a standardized test. Um, So I had a brain that, that adapted very easily to this. I have very mobile attention. Um, It's not good for a lot of other things, but everybody is intuitive all the time. And actually, the first thing that I teach my students and and when I lecture is how to be less intuitive. How do we not have those telepathic dialogues that are beating us down? How do we not be in a remote location and not be fully present to notice the opportunities and and obstacles in our lives in this point in space time? How do we how do we not feel what someone else is feeling? You know, it's so we're all intuitive all the time. The way to train intuition is multifold, but also easy because, again, you're always getting this information. But because we've trained ourselves to only look at this part of the page, you're not noticing it. You keep it below consciousness, which is healthy when you're a child. You don't want to have that expansive reach of information, but it's not, you know, when you want to excel, 
intuition is the thing that will, you know, there are lots of brilliant people with great ideas. Intuition will show you where to go, who to pitch, how to place it and make it a hit. So the first thing is have a goal. And we don't tend to, we tend to think in, in, I have to, or, or I wish, or, oh my God, I hope this doesn't happen. Or why can't I be more like, but everything needs a structure. Information needs a structure. I mean, a book is just a bunch of words until you put it together. Sure. The structure for intuition, and, and I think in many ways for human beings, is to have a goal. So I really suggest to people who want to be intuitive to pick one goal that they're especially driven to achieve. Why especially driven? Because your subconscious is running the show, not your conscious mind. What you decide is kind of a flick. What 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 you've got in here, that stuff that makes you act out when you shouldn't have, that's what's driving. So you want to find some agreement between a conscious goal and what's really driving your machine. So pick a goal that you that you really get that you salivate for. And then what you'll begin to notice once you keep that goal present, and I don't mean to hyper-focus because people hyper-focus and then there's all this information they miss. Mm -hmm. I mean, anchor the goal, go back to it. My group does it at the top of every hour. They go back, we have, uh, people love the word manifestation, it makes me nuts, but we have a manifestation moment. My my very handsome husband is 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 walking in from dinner. Hello. Are you gonna Hello. Very nice to meet you. And so, so, um, so I really suggest that people have a goal and that they go back to it. So, so uh, the top of the hour to again even have a structure for working with your goal at the top of the hour. Go back to that goal. Remember what it is, and then document. Most of us don't realize we are intuitive because we are not keeping track of those very important perceptions that we get. And you can't keep track of them in your mind because your mind's a messy place. There's a lot of stuff in there. And it's it all, you know, it's kind of like when you mix all the colors together as a kid and you get a color that's not even a color. So write down those things that come from left field, not the quotidian perceptions you have and that you've always had, but the things that just strike you over the head or the conversations that you never had that all of a sudden you have on the train with someone, note them. And it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to write the great American novel, but make a little note because what you'll find is once you have a goal and once you then document what you're noticing, you'll find that you begin to create a map for yourself. And that's really the first way to engage intuition. There, there are a bunch of others, but I think that that's the most powerful way. Yeah, this is unbelievable. It's interesting. Um, make a long story short, just for time's sake, I reinvented myself in the pandemic. I had spent 13 years on Wall Street and basically I was extremely unhappy. And my soul was being sucked. And in the lockdown, when I finally got quiet, I was able to draw upon some divine inspiration, put it all together. And I've been obsessed with personal development for 15 years. I just didn't think I was worthy of turning that into a career. And then I had this moment where I realized it's more than just a passion. It is my assignment. And I started my brand. And over the last three years, it's really exploded. I say very humbly. For the first time in my life, I'm really in alignment. Uh, and one of the things that, that I've been taking recently, because I love to just continue to learn and sharpen the axe, is Kabbalah. Um, are you familiar? I am. Yeah. And, and even just last night, actually, I was in a class. I go every Wednesday. And we were talking about uh, divine inspiration and how to draw upon it and put yourself in situations where you can, you're more likely to be able to feel that or hear that. And when you were just describing intuition, it feels similar to me. Does that make sense to you or am I off with that? No, it does make sense. Although I would argue, because my best students are not the believers. My best students are traders, mathematicians, you know, people who can follow those invisible thread, because every trader thinks they have a system. But let's be honest, it's pure intuition. You don't have time to make a well-reasoned decision. So so I would argue that those years of a tra being a trader and having to come up 
with the correct information and having that proven or disproven day after day was actually what prepared you to be able to use your intuition in a very um, applicable way in the world by coming up with, with systems that work. Yeah, beautifully said. The concept of energy, um, I'd love to pick your brain a little bit about that. I think it'll be really valuable and helpful for the audience and so forth. Everything is energy. Is that correct? That I think that science and spirituality agree on that single point. Yeah. So how can you, how can we tap into like more positive energy or just the concept that most things are beyond logic? How, like when you talk about manifesting and so forth, and people say it's a vibrational universe based upon science and so forth. How can just by knowing that and having the awareness of it, how can you prosper a little bit more or use that to your advantage? Well, I think some of it is um, is realizing that there is not good energy and bad energy. You didn't you didn't waste your time being in finance. You trained yourself. That was your graduate program. And the way that we frame experience is important because I hate the whole everything happens for a reason. Um, although I think we live in a synchronous universe and in many ways, what it is we are tends to define what it is we bring to us. But the reality is the tough job of being an energetic being in a material body, in a material world is to take what you bump into, and a lot of it's subconscious. Again, if we all consciously structured, we have very weird lives. Um, <laughs> but taking what you bump into and, and saying, okay, these are the ingredients. I can't make brownies, but I can make a wonderful roast and potatoes. You know, and, and if brownies is what I want, well, then maybe I can sell that roast to someone who has brownies. But really to to look for the can do in all situations and also to realize that we are porous beings. So you want to consider um, why and what and who is around you. Um, in in a, my fourth book called The Circle, there's a there's a way to change and it's called and it's called ritual, uh, which is how do we challenge our patterns through intentional rituals? But the gift of doing that is sacredness because what you do is you say, wait a sec, if I'm eating this, if I'm sleeping with this, if I'm going to this every day, if I am hanging out with this, is it sacred? And if it's not sacred, sacred meaning meaningful, why am I doing it? And I think a lot of us get a lot of, you know, it's like when you don't throw out those single socks in the sock drawer, even though you're never going to find their partners. You know, we we take up space with things that, <laughs> really, yeah, but that, that with things that that really occupy our 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 energy. And although energy is infinite, attention is not. And so it's so important, I think, to A, know you are you are always whole. People say I'm not whole. Yeah, you're always whole. You may not like the pieces, but you're always whole. And guess what? The difference between being a child and an adult is you can change it. And I have worked with some hugely successful people. And I have worked with some people who are really you know, have are down beneath the end of their luck. And the key element to change isn't the belief you can. It is the perseverance to keep on doing it and the openness to take new information in, to know you cannot think outside the box. You are the box. Luckily, we live in a world with other people. And so if you let information in, especially information that makes you a little uncomfortable, and if it's safe, you try it out, you'll find that, that you use the energy that we are all connected to well, because you make a tiny shift and everything shifts around you. You know, we all make these huge shifts and we expect big changes, but usually we get big re rebound, but you make a tiny shift 
And because we're a system, living within a system, within a system, which is how energy in the physical world works, your tiny shifts shifts everything. You know, I live in an apartment building. Everyone in my apartment building lives in a completely different world. And that is attentional. And that is the decisions that they make. This is really deep. I, I, this is probably like a typical conversation for you. I love, I can't talk about this stuff enough. I love it. Uh, it, it excites me most. And, and I agree in regards to like the little shifts. And just knowing that, would you say we're a system inside a system inside a system? So, you know, every, every cell in your body is a system and then it creates organs and, and, and your endocrine system and your skin and your bones. And then you interface with the air around you and the people around you and your, your home is a system, your family's a system, your community is a system. It's, and, and what's really interesting, and of course we've all, found this out sometimes the hard way when we make a teeny shift in a relationship like now nah, I'm, I'm i'm not gonna cook dinner any every night anymore and all of a sudden there are earthquakes you know when you make a tiny shift because you are a part of everything and because in a very integral way we are one when you make a tiny shift everything changes around you and sometimes in ways you don't expect sometimes you say okay i'm not going to be a people pleaser anymore and you expect and you expect things to fall apart and people to be angry and actually what begins to happen is for example you find you're funny when you're blunt and people are and different people are attracted to you and they actually make you really happy and your health improves and that allows you to have the energy to work out and you look great and oh my god you bump into your true love at the gym i mean you know we live in these universe in this universe in this world that's so interconnected and and the the reality is and i think that you'll understand this from kabbalah everything has meaning Every gesture, every cell, every sound, every letter, every color, every everything has vibration. Everything has meaning. That science and mysticism, another place where they meet, although they use different language. On the other hand, you know, if you break a mirror, the meaning isn't that you're going to have bad luck. You don't often know what the meaning is. Everything in your life is a sign. And when you look at it that way, you interact with, wow, three things went wrong today. This is a sign maybe that I need to sit down and have a cup of coffee. Um, you know, everything's going right today. Wow. What is, where do I notice? What do I notice I want to do with this? I, I want to be generous. How do I, how do I reach out? Because by the way, unity, our ability to work it with the systems, with each other, there's that saying, all boats rise. And it's, and it is really true. And it's not always easy to do. You know, I think that a lot of people, you know, many of us were raised in, in um, a world where you compete, you know, you compete, there's a winner and there's a loser. But have you ever thought that maybe the loser in the soccer game in middle school actually became a winner because he said, oh, wait, what's important is being with my friends and getting the ice cream afterwards. It's a game. Who cares? And they learn to get along with other people. And they're now, you know, madly in love with the love of their life and running a multi-billion dollar company. I mean, it's you can't you don't we we attribute all of these meanings like dream books that say every cat's sexuality. No, sometimes a cat's a cat, you know? We attribute these things, whereas we often can't because we think from our patterns. So, but when you realize that everything has energy, it really changes the way that you, that you interact even with, with things. You know, it, it it changes the way you evaluate situations. You know, you may hate your job, but making a living may be sacred. And and so you find 
you find the worth. And when you really find the worth, you may find that that just grows because again, it is a system and worth imparts worth. Yeah. Love all this. And you think you described me before because I'm a recovering people pleaser. When I reinvented myself, it was kind of an identity too. And I promised for the first time in my life when I was going to step into this, the unknown, that for the first time I would show up authentically the real raw strange authentic cat that i am and, and i knew that i wouldn't be for everybody uh, but that was okay and ironically when i did that it's when the world really began to see me and the stuff that i thought was so weird and maybe i was insecure about is actually what attracts people to me now so which is interesting i that think was- that's i think that's a very important lesson that we should teach our children earlier mm. which is it's not what makes you popular that's going to make you succeed. And I mean succeed in whatever way you as an individual want to succeed. Mm-hmm. Your, your weird is your superpower. I have a little quote that I love um, and I, uh, that your pathology holds your potential. And it does. I mean, my unique brain, which is only unique now, believe me, in grade school, it wasn't considered unique. But uh, my unique brain, my pathology has given me such an amazing life and other people acknowledge it and value it and value me because of it. It gives me something to offer the world. And really what it is, is it's a neurological blip and a learning disorder. You know, it's a, it's a, it's, and so I think if we look at every person as useful, if we value human life in a different way, and if we teach children and adults, because we didn't learn this, to value ourselves the way we are, which doesn't mean, you know, love yourself. I hear that from my students. I I need to love and accept myself. First, see if there are things that are unacceptable, like an outrageous temper, unacceptable. Um, Always complaining, unacceptable. Like there are things that maybe you shouldn't love. Maybe Mm. some things you shouldn't accept. That's good. But but not because other people don't like them, because they're just not right for your own integrity. Yeah. You know, you are, you are a system, which means the parts of you you don't like, there's don't fall in love with them. Evolve them. Because as a system, you want to love the parts of you. And sometimes you love them by learning something new from somebody. Like I've learned from my husband to hold my temper and be a little more even. Um, and 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 sometimes... You learn to love them because that appreciation for those things are mirrored back. Yeah, I love it. Uh, We have a brand new puppy and he's going a little crazy. So I put him on. I just became, um, I have a grand dog. Oh, what kind? I, it's a mix and it's right now it's tiny. I haven't met my grand dog yet. I will meet my grand dog uh, in two weeks. Um, my my son's dog my son got it uh, so so um so but i i get a lot of pictures and i'm already shopping for clothes and this, um, this is my son he wants to meet you he's a killer oh. too half shitty half poodle and his name is whiskey hello whiskey because of the ears i don't know the kind of the color he's so these poodles are so smart that it's like scary it's like creepy but it's good to train <laughs> But anywho, uh, this, this is awesome. I wanted to ask you about readings. I had this, or well, maybe I still do. I have this like um, perception that I don't want a reading. I don't want like my future told because I don't want to subconsciously manifest something that might not be good for me. Ironically, I was doing my homework for this conversation because I wanted to show it the respect it deserves. And also I'm a fan. And I saw you say that you're glad you didn't back in the day that you might have been divorced because then you wouldn't have gotten remarried or had kids and so forth. Where do you stand with that? And why is a reading really powerful? And why should somebody lean into that? Oh, I knew I was going to get divorced, but I was in, I was young. I was 20. I met him when I was 16 and I was madly in love. And, but I, I, I mean, I had a sense, I think we all have a sense of our future we just, I just had a a little more consciously, Mm. Uh, you know, it wasn't something I wanted and it made me upset and afraid. 
Um, and by the way, the future isn't written in stone. I mean, part of the reason to get a reading is so you change an unpleasant outcome. Um, I mean, I read for companies and if I see that a product isn't going to work or an investment's bad, I, I, the, my, next, my next job is how much control what's in their sphere of control and is what is in their sphere of control something that's going to allow them to change the outcome and then to help them do that. I mean, that's really, that's really my job. Um, I think that um, it, I think it's good to be cautious about getting readings. I mean, I don't, except for my students in workshops who are learning to read themselves, and so they know it's a somewhat imperfect skill. Um, I only read companies, so I only read people who are who will a fire me if I'm wrong too much, um, and who have experts already, you know, um, I, when I read for a drug company, they have really smart scientists getting their own data. So I'm just kind of out of the box data. I, and then my information can be proven or disproven. I think when someone's saying something about your life, um, you want to be careful, not, not because uh, they'll put an idea in your head. Because if you think of it, if everything in your life isn't the way you want it, you probably have some ideas in your head already that shouldn't be there. They may not be from an intuitive, maybe they're from your upbringing, uh, maybe they're from a trauma, but, but um, it's not so much the influence. It's that A, you're giving that sight, that power to somebody else. Um, which can be helpful because it's hard to predict for yourself because you're influenced by what you want and what you're afraid of. True. But also, you know, the way that that most intuitives are trained isn't really evidence based. And so you want a timeline with the reading. You want to know A and then B and then C, not just, oh, this will happen because you have no way of of seeing if it's happening. I think it's I think you should never give your power away. And I think it's important to be curious about everything. One of my favorite quotes, not my own, is the good scientist suspends disbelief and runs the experiment anyway. You know, that said, people tend to go for readings when they're psychologically vulnerable, and that is not the right time unless you've had a good experience with someone who has great integrity, who you know is not only incredibly accurate, but knows when to keep their mouth shut about things too. Um, I just had a, 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 a former student who's a friend who I basically haven't talked to for a year because if I opened my mouth, I would have said, you are not gonna do this, you're going to do that. And this is how it's gonna go down. And I knew, that that wasn't ethical, that I needed to let this person come to this conclusion for themselves. And that, what if I were wrong? I could have, you know, and, and we just got back in touch because this person reached out to me and said, you know, I know why you didn't, I know why you haven't called and, you know, this is happening. And so can you call me now? Um, but, you know, be careful there, be careful of your doctor, go in, ask questions, be careful of, any kind of coach or counselor that doesn't uh, doesn't empower you. That's a very long answer to the question. I think you have to be cautious. I, I think though, having a sense of the future is incredibly helpful. And often it does take someone outside of ourself to give us that sense. Because again, you are, you are on your track yeah. and, and perhaps your future is on this track, which you can't see. Whereas someone with detachment, an intuitive with detachment, um, can see it. But one of the things that I do, and I really believe in this strongly, is I create intuitive groups. So like my students in my boot camp, they are an ongoing group. And I have students from 35 years ago who still read each other. Some of them have met, they've become friends, but some of them have never met and they just exchange information. And it is really helpful to have people who, who, who are outside of your box to predict, because then you can say, okay, is this an outcome I want? 
If not, how do I change it? Even if I do want it, what are the things that might be able to make it even more productive? Um, so I'm a big believer in precognition and I, it's something I value when people give it to me. I, I, you know, I have people who, I mean, my students are amazing and I get emails that say, you know, they're going to, I see a suitcase, it's blue, they're going to lose it. And so I put my junk in that and sure enough, that suitcase, no matter how much I tried to change it, it's not in my sphere of control, doesn't get lost when I thought it was, got lost, you know, in a shorter flight, but it's very helpful, very helpful to know what's going on. That was very helpful from being honest. And it makes me much more inclined to lean in for someone that's listening right now. And they're like, okay. Um, I would like to work with someone to find out about this. Maybe they don't have the means to work with you per se. Maybe they do. And we'll put that on. I, I only work with companies. I train people. I'm a, I'm a believer in what I just said. Yeah. People can go on my Instagram. I ha have them write down three goals and you tag somebody you don't know and you don't know which goal because I pick a coin and even I don't know which number goal they number them. And complete strangers do readings for you and they do it in community. It's not something you have to pay for and they are uncanny. The rule is though, you've got to do them too. And I do have a short video posted on how to do it. Um, but I, I think it's really important to work in a group and I do that every morning. Well, now not morning because I'm in Italy. So for everyone, it's it's a little later, but. What time is it by you right now? It is 10 19 p.m thursday night uh add doesn't live by days it's definitely night understood okay this is it so is the month fun. of november that's about as far as i can get this is so much fun and, and also what you said it makes so much sense like you're we're obviously biased about our own life and sometimes we get clouded by what we might want even though it might not be what's best for us it reminds me of that quote, I might butcher it. It's like, you can't see the label from inside the jar, something like that. Oh, wow, I never heard that. It's a great yeah. one. I'm going to steal that. Yeah, that's why it's so good to have coaches and mentors, just because they might be able to guide you. Maybe they have more experience or they've made the inevitable mistakes first and they can kind of guide you. But that's not even talking about like, you know, intuitive stuff, just someone that, somebody else from, with a fresh perspective. Absolutely. That, I think that is essential. I mean, it it really, um, you know, nobody sees outside their own box. I don't care how visionary people think they are. And, and that's true of me also. I have learned so much about my life, actually, from my students who say, this didn't work. Or, you know, do you really want to do this? Or, you know, do you really want to speak that way? Or do you really want to wear that? I mean, it's just, it's so helpful to get outside input. Um, and I think it also helps us form the core of, you started this interview by saying what's non-negotiable. And I think that we all have a non-negotiable core of self that is important to us. And I think it's hard to define, um, but, there, there are, you know, there are lots of things that are variables that you can move around. And then there are those things that if you move them around, they really tear into you. They just are not quite right. And I think, I think people have a, have a sense of that. And we've lost that a little bit with so much media. I mean, I love social media because it allows me to have a group that I, in my pajamas, I get together with a group of people who do intuition every morning on Instagram. I love it. On the other hand, you know, you, you look at it and there's a uniformity. You know, this is how to be successful. And the fact of the matter is, there is not one way to be successful. We are all such unique beings with unique talents. Even if we are one energy, every single individual is a essential, unique, and different part of it. And if you're not expressing who, the highest octave of who you are, instead of some template, which is what coaches are great for, is saying, this is who you are, why don't you try singing in this key? This seems to be your key. 
not the key of the song you want to sing, but this is your key. So maybe you find the right song in your key. And all of a sudden you say, wow, who knew this is my song? And then everyone hears it. And then you've got a flourishing life. That's brilliant. That's kind of what happened to me. But it, a word that comes to mind is alignment. Yeah. Being in alignment. And, and, and by the way, if you're, I mean, I'm going to be 65 in March. 65 where, years young. 65, you know, either way, whatever. It was hard <laughs> to be 35. I would not, you couldn't pay me to go back to that. I mean, I'd like to bite my baby's thighs once mm. more, but no. Um, but but the reality is your alignment changes. And if it doesn't change, you are not reaching your potential, which means you're going to have your face in the dirt every once in a while. Um, that, that's just what happens. You get knocked off your horse. And then if you take a moment to not just try to jump back on the horse and to not, you know, beat your breast, but if you take a moment, you may look down and find gold. And it's really important to be in alignment, but also know when your old alignment, whether it's you, the company, or you, a person, or in a relationship, where your old alignment is something you've grown out of. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes people make and one of the most profound gifts of intuition, whether you use it in a business or in your personal life, is it's good at saying, wait, pay attention over here, pay attention. I know you're a mammal and you don't want change. And it feels, you know, when you change, you basically, all your super skills that made you so cool, all of a sudden you're in a new new place and you, it's a different language and your super skills, well, they were great there, but they don't work here. So you're naked and you're vulnerable. And sometimes it's because you've gotten knocked on your ass. And guess what? If, and again, if, it's not everything happens for a reason because you can stay on your ass. But if you say, okay, not, oh, I'm not on my ass. It's all fine. But no, I'm on my ass in the dirt. What can I do right now? You know, I can build a mud castle. What can I do right now? And that from there, great worlds are born. My goodness. That's where we dropped the mic. This is unbelievable. Uh, you bring the poet. <laughs> what's that? I said, you bring out the poet in me. Good, good. A great conversation. I had some things that I wanted to ask you, of course, but I just let the conversation like off the cuff. I think those are the most valuable. I wanted to ask you one other thing before we land the plane. Mediumship. What is that exactly? So mediumship, intuition is a multi-spoked umbrella. There's telepathy, which is the ability to communicate over a distance with another set of energy or for another person or even a group there's remote viewing the ability to really define and describe a remote location without ever seeing it um there's uh precognition the ability to put your attention in the future and accurately define it mediumship is actually a position of attention it's the ability to become something so it's the ability for you to actually be Laura for a moment and experience the life, your life as me. And then you can mix it up and be, a, be something else. Like you could be a company. You can be your company now and you might be surprised. This people can do for themselves. If you are your company now and you don't think it, you allow yourself to be it, would you do by saying, okay, I'm my company. What do I notice? Mm, wow, I'm um, I'm having trouble figuring out my my next direction. And you feel it in your arm. My next direction really isn't based on the last thing I did. And so I'm trying to figure. I, I I'm I'm uncomfortable. I want to make a transition. And then you can move yourself in the future. So mediumship is being something from its own perspective. If it's if I say be this bottle and you are the bottle and from that you can tell the bottle's faults how the body of the bottle perceives itself now mediumship is also often used esoterically to to you know uh define someone maybe who's died or 
to um that's what I thought it had to do with, if I'm being honest. No, I mean, you you can actually do that using any of the skills. Mm. Um, and that's, of course, I mean, that's a whole other discussion because we don't know, is that energy that's left behind? Is that a pattern of energy that's left behind? Is it actually the dead person? There's a lot of, I was, I was doing a little mediumship for a friend the other night, and I, I never do it professionally. I just do it for my students and my friends. And um, his brother who had died was sitting in a chair wearing this sports shirt that ended up, they had just, he looked it up, they had just played that their first game that day. I could only describe it by color because the only sport I, I do is eating. But, um, <laughs> and, and he looked at me and he said, we've known each other a real, we've known each other for 30 years. We've known each other a long time because this should really be freaking me out and it's not. <laughs> I thought that was funny, but mediumship is all of our ability to become anything because the reality is our separation from everything is is only one reality there's another reality that i am you you are me i am this bottle we are everything energy is everything the core of energy is all united and actually it's my experience and belief that to be an individual, to have an ego, to have drive, to build in the world, to build in community is actually the spiritual task, you know, that, that we evolve that perfect energy. Because if something's perfect, think about it, it's not changing much, right? If you're omniscient, omnipresent and omnipotent, there's not a lot of change. Who changes? Think about what you do in the first half hour when you wake up. It's so many things. And you do that all day and then you repeat it again. And then you do it within the system of other human beings and their needs and all the events that take place. That's a big job. We do a big job. And what I love about intuition is it helps us do it economically with less mistakes, less effort spent, more correct decisions. And, you know, economy is alchemy. That is the magic of being a human being, is learning, going back to sacredness. This is coming up. This is past. This is good for me. This is a waste of my time. And, and let me cut to the chase here so that I can choose the moments where I want to just inhabit for a little bit longer. I think this is so fascinating. I just wanted to ask you real quick, those gifts that you mentioned a couple minutes ago that some people are born with, like yours, for example. All people are born with them. Really? There's nobody who is not an intuitive. And I do, I've been going around to Soho houses because I get bored if I don't work. So I'll, like you Soho. know, Rome and I did a Soho house event the other night complete strangers who have no idea I'm just the event that night mm -hmm. they come they come in they sit down I give them a few moments of instruction and then I say you're going to do a reading for the person who's sitting next to you and if they know each other then I switch them up and they do wonderful readings and they're blown away it's not the magic of my teaching skill it's that they do that all the time I just unmasked it what about telepathy well, think of all the conversations you're having in your head. All, those conversations are taking place in real time. Now, the person that you're having them with may not be conscious of it. And by the way, you we all think we initiate everything. You may not have initiated that conversation. Have you ever had someone who, you know, who who didn't get in touch with you and you're thinking about them and you're thinking about them and you're talking to them in your head? And the minute you get distracted and stop doing that, they call. Why should they call when they're having, when they're getting that satisfaction in the telepathy and that back and forth conversation? On the other hand, learning how to send effective telepathy is important, especially in business. Um, although also in relationship, you know, if you're mad at your, your I, I know you're engaged. If you're, you know, when your partner walks in, if you're angry, don't try to push it down because telepathically they're going to walk in defensive say you know 
you didn't do the dishes again. And I just want to let you know I'm upset about it so I can let it go. Um, the less subtext, a lot of times in relationships, our subtext gets transmitted. On the other hand, I often teach actors or people going for jobs before they go in, know who you're going to meet. And sometimes you just know intuitively, you see two people in the room and then you notice this is the decision maker. And then take a moment to feel what would make them say yes? And what do you have that resembles that? And try to begin that connection. Watch you walk in the room and you have an immediate connection. But also stop some of those dialogues that aren't good. I mean, having, you know, I I'm famous for having an argument in my head for half an hour from the person who cut me off on the highway. I mean, really, that is a complete waste of energy. I'm just a little compulsive. Um, but those energy, you know, those conversations you're having with a friend you're pissed off with, either put a period at the end of it, let them know you're pissed off, work it out and stop occupying that important space that you need to negotiate in other things in your life with, or decide they're not important. And every time you have begin that conversation, re redirect it toward a conversation with someone you want to have. It's really important to realize that your telepathic space is as real as a conversation you're having with someone in a room and sometimes has a lot more impact because because we tend to have them obsessively one of the ways you know it's telepathic is it goes on and on it's not a one-off and it's really important to be able to remove yourself from those so to be clear to clarify when you're saying you're having a conversation with somebody and it's like taking up unnecessary space important space put a period on it or just realize it's not important or you want to let it go and then redirect it. You're talking about the conversation you're having in your head, not actually physically with them, correct? You are actually having it physically with them. And there's oh. a lot of research on that. So you put a period on it by, by every time, because we're creatures of habit. Every <laughs> time, and sometimes in the beginning, you need to do it 300 times a day. Every time you're having that conversation, you notice it. And you say, okay, wait, who do I want to talk to? And you metaphorically turn your head and have another conversation until from habit, you no longer have a conversation with them. Then chances are they will pick up that phone and call you. So be prepared and know what you actually, you know, what, what, what you want to say. Nothing um, is a coincidence. Nothing is random. Nothing is random, but but we create those synchronicities. I mean, we are, when, when there, when I create difficulties in my life, I, I ask, I ask myself, okay, not why is this happening to me? Because I don't believe things happen. I believe we engage with them often subconsciously. Um, and I ask, okay, what is the scenario that I'm acting out? You know, why am I doing this and how do I, how do I shift this now? And it's, it's hard. We are creatures of habit. It takes real discipline to redirect into more, you know, healthier activities. And that's true for companies too. I mean, they talk about company culture. It's company habit and culture needs to be reinvented because the minute you hire a new employee, it's a new culture. Sure. Yeah. In Kabbalah recently, they were describing just what you just said. And my teacher was like, ask yourself, why is this happening in my movie? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, and, and, you know, the other good thing about doing that is when it's all your fault, you're the one who can fix it. Mm -hmm. And just to kind of close that loop on what you were saying before, if there's someone from your past that you're thinking about, but you haven't spoken with them in years and you don't really want to, at that point, should you reach out or should you, every time you think of them, redirect your thoughts to something else? Redirect. I mean, it's often because they're thinking of you. And if it's not someone you want a connection with, it's better to redirect. They may reach out and call you, mm -hmm. but if, but it's really, you know, it's important to be a semi-permeable membrane in general in life and to decide what comes in and what doesn't. And, you know, a lot of us give ourselves a bunch of shoulds 
it's important to investigate those should. Sometimes you do something that's not great and that costs you because it's just the right thing to do and it's within your integrity, even if it's, oh, you know, can't stand that person, not nice, but I feel like this is the right thing. It's, But sometimes it's habit, someone else's value, being a people pleaser, you know, uh, being hyper responsible. And those times it's really important to redirect because it's, it's unpopular in the spiritual culture, but the reality is the first person you have responsibility for is you. And if you take good care of you, if you can be proud of you, if you get you what you need in the world in every way, you have a whole lot to give everyone else. This is so good. The only negative I got going on is we don't have 30 hours to chat, but I know it's just the beginning of the friendship. Um, for our listeners that are probably obsessed with this conversation, I imagine, what's the best way for everybody to support you and what are you most excited about right now? Um, well, lauraday.com is my website. Uh, there are a lot of Laura Days. Uh, I'm the writer intuitive. Um, I think there's a stripper. I think there's... Uh, <laughs> definitely an interior designer we used to get each other's fan mail from prisons um but um but where by the way a lot of really amazing people who read books are which we found out um but anyway i digress um what i'm excited about i'm excited about my new book which is not going to be out until september so we won't speak about it i'm really excited september 2024 um, yes um, I'm really excited about um, doing Instagrams where people just come on and read. Uh, I, I really love it. And I do it at a different time each day. I try to post it in stories. But I, I, I really enjoy uh, reading with people. And we also do a lot of healing with people. We do a lot of community outreach. The Instagram group started during COVID and People were paying each other's bills, finding disposable diapers for people with children. I mean, it was really, an, it's an amazing group of people. So that's, that's, that, that is uh, what's important to me that I love, I, you know, the books I've written, um, I love because they're workshops. So you can do the book. They're not reading books. They take time and commitment, but you can do the book and then you can teach it. Or you can create an intuitive business group or an intuitive investing group or uh, an intuitive love group. Um, you know, I, I, I uh, so I, I mean, I'm excited about, about all the things I do. I, I really enjoy, I enjoy my work and the part I enjoy the most is seeing other people do it, especially beginners, you know, especially the person, there's always that person in a workshop, you know, or in an evening event who wants to argue the science and it's like, really, you know, go on PubMed. The research is that I don't want to argue it. You don't believe, why are you here tonight? Yeah. There was something else to do. Right. And then 10 minutes later, after a complete stranger has told them details about their life they couldn't possibly know, they're like, there you have, there, there. that's why I have good, good therapy referrals for people. They're like, wait, this doesn't exist. How did this person just do this? Or how did I just do this? Yeah. I think it's so interesting that you said it before. Everybody has these, but other people, such as maybe yourself, know how to hyper like really extract them, these gifts. Well, they've been in situations where they had to. I mean, I, I think, you know, childhood intuitives usually have, you know, ADHD and seizure disorders or head injuries. Um, and traumatic situations where they had to function way above their pay grade. Mm -hmm. And once again, it's an upside of, you know, of a difficult, of a difficult thing. Um, I, I always, I always ask my students, think of the most traumatic thing. What is the thing that ruined your life? And now if it were a gift, what did you get from it? And you discover things about yourself because what we do well we overlook you know my, my husband's an incredible writer and in the beginning of our marriage we would write memoir together every morning and he he would say well why are you writing about this the the way what you saw as a child and how you could foretell this and that that's what's interesting and i'm like 
No, it's not. What's interesting is growing up with a manic depressive mother and blah, blah, blah. Because what's unique about you it, it is something really you often don't see. So true. Yeah, beautifully said. Uh, this has been so much fun. Hang out for one second. I want to connect with you after. Laura, I want you to know the definition of authenticity, curiosity, and deep intuitive wisdom. I could personally guarantee your best is yet to come. Keep on spreading your wings and leaving your mark on this world. So much love and respect for you. Thank you so much for stopping by and dropping these priceless, juicy nuggets today. Thank you so much. This is really fun. I mean, I could talk to you all day. <laughs> Are we off now? Yeah. Oh, good, 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 good.